from the foundation of Rome and its first king, lost through the mists of time, all but passed into legend, to the men responsible for the downfall of the Roman monarchy and the Romans swearing off all kings. Let us talk about Rome's last king, Lucius Darwinus Superbus. Hello all you funky people, Funky Monkey here, welcome to today's episode, and I'm glad you're joining me. So, how are you? How's life treating you? All good? Perfect, then let's get to it. This is part 4 and the last one on the Roman monarchy. In the first episode we spoke of the legends around the foundation of Rome and its first king, the legendary Romulus. In the second we spoke of his first three successors, Numa, Postilius and Marcius. In the third we spoke of Lucius Darwinus Priscus and Sergius Tullius and now for the grand finale, especially for the Roman monarchy, Lucius Darwinus Superbus, the man who fucked up so fiercely that it made Romans gag and revolt only at the thought of having a king. But what did he do that was so bad and how did he do it? Well, I'm glad you asked. Stick around and I'm sure you'll find out things that you were almost definitely never taught in school and you'll get details that will inspire you in your world building as they can easily make their way in any fantasy setting. Before we jump in our story, let me tell you about the mini or the miniatures I'll be painting today. Last minute, I decided to paint only one miniature. What I have here is an infantryman from Westkids. I have two of these lovely minis and decided to leave one for a future paint when I level up my painting skill a little so I could do a side-by-side -side comparison. See? I'm planning ahead. To be honest, this miniature is a breath of fresh air. It's not pretentious, it's not super sophisticated, it's not insanely intricate and I really enjoyed just playing around with it. I think I'm coming off the homemade miniature rush from the previous weeks when I made three miniatures and painted them and I'm just enjoying something simple. Anyway, let's talk about what I want to do with this brave footman. I started off with Storm Vermin Fur, a darker grey as a base, then highlighted with Administratum Grey and finished off the Zenithal Priming with PBO White. But I wanted to try something extra. Once the Zenithal was in place, I went in with pure white and accentuated certain areas, such as the rim of the shield, the crossbands on the helmet, the sword and his knee. I wanted to make sure that these areas really really pop. I'm going for a white surcoat with red stripes a white shield with a symbol dyed red, classic chainmail and helmet, and a rugged, itchy, sand-colored bedroll. I will mostly focus on the surcoat as it covers most of the infantryman's body and on the shield. I feel like I don't really know how to properly paint with white, so this is a very good exercise and I'm not concerned if something goes wrong. It's an experience, but I honestly feel like there's nothing that can go wrong. Maybe I'm a little bit unfair towards this miniature, but I'm just enjoying the process. I spent more time than usual with the Zenithal Priming, but it will pay off in the end. Now that you know what I'm going for, let's go through the pre-story checklist. I have some fresh coffee in my mug. I have a bit of very awesome tea in my mousse cup. I have my assistants running around, so if you hear them meow, yeah, they're very, very hungry. And again, I have something, something for the soul. How about you? Are you ready for a story filled with violence, gore, depravity and betrayal? Are you also comfy cozy and with something tasty to drink on hand? Perfect. Then I think it's time for a story. Quick recap on how Lucius Tarwinus, not yet named Superbus, came on the throne. Once Lucius Tarwinus, the son of the old king Lucius, Lucius Tarwinus Priscus and Tanaquil, summoned the senators to the Curia in the dead of night after plotting with his wife and members of the senate that his father gave seat to, it was on. He could not and would not back down. The old king, Servius Tullius, arrived at the Curia once he was told that the senators had been summoned before King Tarwinus. He started berating the young man telling him that he should have at least had the common decency to wait for the king to die before sitting in his cruel chair. Tarwinus retaliated by attacking his origins, naming him the son of a slave, and then turned physical. 
picked up the king by the waist and threw him down the stairs of the Curia Hostilia, the Roman Senate. The old king, injured, barely able to stand, without any help or escort, tried to make his way back to the relative safety of his home on the Esquiline Hill. Tarvinus was not done with him and sent people after Tullius to have him killed. Only a few meters away from his home, Tullius was killed in the street, and thus ended the reign of a pretty decent king that sat on Rome's throne. That street was called, from that moment onward, the Street of Crime. Once this came to pass, Tarwinus began implementing his own vision of what the monarchy could and should be. He started by denying the old king a funerary, and he argued that Romulus didn't have a proper funerary, so Tullius most definitely shouldn't have one. He ordered the murder of the most notable of senators, those whom he believed sided with the old king and helped him run the state as it was normal. He was also aware that he set a dangerous precedent, that of taking the throne through murder and violence. So he started making preparations to prevent that from ever happening to him. So he created a very uh, well-trained personal guard for himself. He knew that unlike his predecessors, he was neither elected to be a king, nor was he beloved. So he decided to do the classic idiotic thing that has played the world since its infancy. And seems to be a motto for... Many people who have a smidge of power of any kind. If you cannot rule through love, then rule through fear. In order to instill fear deep in the hearts of his subjects, without any advisors and counsel he tried cases, decided what the punishment would be, disregarding the old ways and even laws, and through this he sentenced many to capital punishment, to exile and a very few simply to losing all of their property. He did this to those whom he suspected of plotting against him, those who he disliked, and even to some individuals just for the opportunity to take over their property and enrich himself. Oh, and of course, he alone investigated, tried and sentenced those whom he believed were against him or those who were accused of uttering anything against the king. He mostly targeted senators and executed or exiled a large number among them, but did not name anybody else in their place. He did this to instill terror in the ranks of the nobility and dilute their power. Moreover, although all of his predecessors, going back to Romulus, asked for the vote of the senate and that of the people when deciding treaties, alliances, war and gatherings, Tarwinus did not, and he alone decided the fate of the city without any counsel. The Romans started calling him Superbus, translated as proud, but it was not in the majestic sense. It was more along the lines of the other meanings of the word proud. Arrogant, insolent, vain, domineering. You know, the good stuff. To increase his security in Rome, he wanted to make sure that he had as few enemies abroad as he could. So he reached out and forged alliances with many neighboring nations. To the Latin king Octavius Mamilus of Tusculum, he gave his daughter in marriage and thus forged a very strong relationship. He bestowed on the senators and noble families of Tusculum many grandiose gifts. Once he gained their favor, he invited all Latin nobility to a meeting. Once the nobles were assembled there, he was late. Actually, he summoned them in the early hours of the morning and he arrived a little before sundown. In his absence, there was a noble who spoke out against him, Turnus Herdonius of Arikia. He tried to stir his people, giving the Romans as an example of how his people would end up if they bowed to Tarwinus. Late in the afternoon, Tarwinus arrived and because he was advised to excuse himself for his tardiness, he said he had to reconcile a father and son and that's why he was late. Of course, Turnus called him out on his lie and left the council. This really angered Arwinus, but there was nothing he could do then and there. If Turnus were a Roman, not a Latin, he would immediately put him to death for his insolence. Instead, he found a solution for removing Turnus. Through noblemen among the Latins that he bought off, he bribed one of Turnus's slaves with gold and had him bring, in the dead of night, a large number of swords in his enslavers in lodgings. With the deed done, Tarwinus summoned the leader of the Latin city in which Turnus was spending the night and informed him that the reason he was actually late the previous day was because he was investigating a matter of grave 
urgency that Turnus was plotting to take out the leaders of the Latin cities during the meeting and install himself as the sole ruler of the Latin people. He said that the plan was to have the council members and Tarwinus himself murdered at the meeting, but his dirtiness saved all their lives. This also explains Turnus's outburst and speech against Tarwinus. The nobles were informed and they were inclined to believe this as the nobles were informed and they were inclined to believe this as this would explain Tarwinus's tardiness as something that saved them and not something that offended them. And of course, they were desperate to find explanations that would put them to rest hearing rumors of how Tarwinus was treating Rome. Tarwinus urged the leader of the city to verify this by simply checking Turnus's chambers, as he knew for a fact that swords would be found there, swords that would be used against him and the council. Accompanied by guards, the leader went to the inn and burst in Turnus's chambers, startling him. His slaves were overpowered and the swords found both in his chambers and around the inn. The council members were informed. The word spread and the people were appalled, as Turnus was a man of very good standing. Because of the proof found against him and Tarwinus's machinations, he did not get the chance of pleading his case and he was executed in a horrific way at Tarwinus's suggestion. He was tied up and plunged in the waters of the Ferentine with a large wicker basket filled with stones to weigh him down. Of course, Many of the council members knew what was going on and had a suspicion that Tarwinus was behind all of this, but they were at this point too afraid to do anything. The next day, they were summoned once more and Tarwinus suggested that the treaty between the Romans and Latins would be renewed, as in the times of Ancus Marcius, their cities were razed. As it happened in the time of his father, so it was high time that this would be forever avoided, with the king of the Latins besides Tarwinus, as he had married Tarwinus's daughter, and with the fresh image of Turnus' execution in their mind, they all agreed. The Latin army was summoned to the grove shortly thereafter. Tarwinus did not really like the idea of the Latins having their own officers, banners and command structures, so he melded his army with the Latins, making out of every two maniples only one led by a Roman centurion, thus doubling his army and ensuring the Latins' loyalty. This is a perfect moment for a break before things get really nasty. But before we get to the memes, hit that like button and show me you found out something new today. Hit that subscribe button and join this growing funky community and make sure the bell is on so you are notified when a new video is out. And if you miss seeing my lovely assistants, Mango and Potato, make sure you check out TW Creative Cats, a channel that has nothing to do with history and everything to do with cat adventures. And I will also continue sharing with you the many names and titles Potato has. Her fourth name is Dust. For this miniature, I am using three different grey paints. Storm Vermin Fur, that I left in the deepest recesses, Administratum Grey for the mid-tones and Grey Seer for the faintest of shadows. I'm going back and forth between these paints until I'm happy with how the surcoat looks. As you can see, I'm also going back and forth between the surcoat and the shield. For both, I'm using the same color scheme and I'm experimenting with both at the same time being different mm, surfaces. Because I want to keep some of the grey visible and smooth transitions at the same time, I am using a China white ink. It is very transparent, just enough to allow the grey poke through and smooth out transitions. I find it pretty difficult to paint cloth and make it look real, but I'm getting there by taking small baby steps. I am doing the same with the red colors, three different nuances. Corn red in the deepest recesses, Mephiston red, Midtone and Evil Sun Scarlet as a highlight. Of course, I missed a stripe when painting them in, but this gave me the opportunity of really highlighting that knee. Let's continue. Locius Tarwinus Superbus, after doubling his army, started war after war with his neighbors, just to make sure that his people were too busy to revolt. First, he started the war with the Volsci and took Suessa Pometia from them, the city where his father's assassins, the sons of Ancus Marcius, took refuge but he could not 
actually defeat the Volsci in the war and the war lasted for 200 years after his death. So that was a big L for the Romans. He also started the war with the neighboring city of Gabi. In essence, according to Livy, he was not really a bad commander, but his actions sapped the spirit of his men, so they fought less fiercely. They didn't want to be there. He was unable to storm Gabi and take it in one go, and being pushed back from its walls, he resorted to treachery, his main strength. He retreated back to Rome and started building a temple to Jupiter. While pretending to be busy with that, he instructed his youngest son, Sextus Tarwinus, to pretend he ran from Rome and from his father's bloodlust and was in search of a refuge among his enemies and enemies of Rome, for among its friends he was in danger. Sextus reached Gabian because he was able to provide them with intel on the Roman armies, plans and movements, and because he convinced them that Arwinus was now doing to his family what he did to his subjects, they granted him sanctuary. Slowly but surely, he was able to gain their trust, as he had his father's oratory gifts and spun good tales. He was able to have the leaders of Gabi believe that it was a very good thing that he came to them as, with his help, they would be able to move the war from Gabi's walls to Rome's gates. Soon enough, Sextus was granted membership to the city council and there he was able to show his worth by giving details of how the Romans trained and what tactics they used. He was allowed to observe how the Gabinian army trained and he was able to compare the two forces and improve the Gabinian tactics against Rome. He was then given a very small elite unit and allowed to skirmish with the Romans and pillage their lands, with Sextus being so well versed in lying and with the Gabinians being so eager to gain any advantage against Rome, they were caught. All of the skirmishes against Rome, Sextus and his men won. He returned with plunder and wealth. His soldiers, at first instructed to keep an eye on him, started to love him. For he would join in battle and endure the same hardships as they did, and when dividing the spoils they would get their fair share. Soon enough, he was named head of the Gabinian army, as the city council saw that he was indeed hell-bent on defeating his father and he was eager to kill Romans. He cared for his men and he was a military genius, not suffering any defeats. Please bear in mind at the same time that indeed he killed Roman soldiers in these skirmishes. I am struggling to wrap my mind around the fact that Arwinus was sending soldiers to their death knowingly and I wonder what the officers were telling these soldiers, the people they were responsible for. I wonder how poorly these soldiers were prepared and led in these skirmishes, especially for this. And I am sure there were also some survivors, and I am sure they were taken out as to not spread the word of the betrayal of their officers, otherwise the army would have been inclined to revolt against Arminus. This makes my skin crawl. So, Sextus became the de facto leader of the Gabinian army. Because he always returned with plunder, the citizens of Gabi considered Sextus Tarwinus a godsend and supported him without question. Eventually, Sextus sent an envoy to his father asking him how he wanted to proceed now the Gabini were eating out of the palm of his hand. The envoy reached Tarwinus who did not trust him. The Roman king walked in the gardens with the envoy following him. The king seemed angered beyond belief at his son's message and, using his walking stick, he cut off the heads of the tallest puppies in his garden. The envoy asked the king for an answer a few more times, but the king refused to utter a single word to the envoy. Eventually, the messenger left the king's presence without an answer before he lost his own head. Returning to Sextus, the messenger reported everything. The king's son knew exactly what his father's message was. He started taking out Gabi's senate members. Some were tried before the people and exiled, with their properties and wealth forfeit. Others were executed in public for their crimes. The most beloved among them were assassinated. And the wealth of those deemed enemies of the state was divided between Sextus, his people, and the citizens of Gabi, thus helping them forget how this happened and enthralled them even more. Then, one day, the city was surrendered to Lucius Tarquinus Superbus without a fight. Once this came to pass, 
Tarwinus renewed treaties with the Etruscans to ensure he would not be attacked by them, and turned his attention to Rome once more. He dedicated a whole area to Jupiter and forbade any other temple or shrine be built on the Tarpeian Mount. Now, for a bit of story that could easily make its way in any fantasy setting. While digging the foundation of the temple, a human head was found with all features intact. Augurs, both Roman and Etruscans, were summoned to interpret the sign. They all said it was a clear sign that Rome was to be the head of the world. This encouraged Arwinus to expand the works and the money destined for the whole temple were now barely sufficient for the foundation. Because the work was enormous, he brought builders from across Etruria and decreed that the plebeians working on the temples would have this period considered as military service as the work was grueling. But for the plebs it was perhaps better than working on the construction of the Cloaca Maxima, the sewage system of Rome. The king also wanted to expand the Roman borders, so he ordered the establishment of two new colonies, Signia and Circe. At one point, a terrible omen appeared in the king's palace. A snake was said to have appeared out of a wooden pillar. The king took this as a bad sign, so he decided to send envoys to the Oracle of Delphi in Greece, the most famous oracle in the ancient world. As he did not trust any Roman or Etrurian augurs with his query, lest the word spread to the people and they got ideas, he sent two of his sons, Titus and Aruns, and alongside them he sent young Lucius Junius Brutus, his nephew, son of Tarwinia, his daughter. Brutus was cut from a different cloth than his cousins and uncle. Hearing and seeing how many men of import were put to death, even his own brother, he decided that he would let nothing throw even the slightest shadow of doubt in the mind of the king, nor would he have anything that the king wanted. Thus, he shrouded himself in utter stupidity, and allowed his property to become the spoil of the king and him the butt of jokes. It was safer than uttering a single word that might have been interpreted as being against the king or having a single quality that the king might consider even slightly threatening. He was given the name Brutus, meaning inert, immovable or heavy, or more akin perhaps to dense. To Delphi he was sent to accompany his cousins more as a joke and to do the menial jobs rather than having a meaningful role. Now, for a part of the story that, again, can be set uh, in any fantasy setting. So, they reached the oracle in Delphi and curiosity grew in them. And after carrying out the instructions of the king and getting the answer they were looking for, the young men asked the oracle whom betwixt them would be next to rule. The oracle answered that the first one to kiss their mother would be the one to rule Rome. So. The sons of the king convinced Brutus, and all three swore to keep this a secret, especially since Sextus, who was back home, knew nothing of this prophecy. They then drew lots on uh, who was the first to kiss their mother upon returning home, so that they would ensure that that individual would be the rightful heir. But Brutus interpreted this answer differently, and in his supposed stupidity he stumbled and kissed the earth as he considered that the earth was the common mother of all mortals. Returning home, war preparations were in full swing in Rome again, this time against another neighbor, the Rutuli. Before we continue with our story, it is time for another break, as the minis deserve another look. For the chainmail, I am using Led Belcher as a base color. I left the metal parts last, as I think they are the easiest to paint this time around, because I am going for something very simple. No burning sword for this infantryman, although, come to think about it, I could have given him a fiery sword, but I think common sense would have told him not to pick it up and become a clear target on the battlefield. Nah, he would have stuck to his silvered weapon. Once the metal parts are done, I want to apply some washes on everything except the surcoat. I will use Null Oil for the metal parts and Agrax Earthshade for the leather parts as well as the bedroll. While the Null Oil will be drying, I will be applying the Earthshade, and while the Earthshade will be drying, I can come in with Lead Belcher again, reapply the base coat, and then highlight using Stormhouse Silver, to talk about efficiency. 
I'm careful not to touch the circuit and mess up the white painting as it would be quite difficult to repair it. Okay, I need some coffee. Let's continue. Tarwinus Superbus tried to take the city of Ardea from the Rutuli, but failed to do so. He laid siege to the city and dug trenches around it. The war prolonged more than usual and the soldiers were becoming antsy, as they were rarely allowed to go back home on leave, while the officers would get a break more often. One night, the princes were drinking in Sextus Tarquinus's chambers alongside their cousin Tarwinus Colatinus, Egerus' son, and started bragging about their wives. They tried to decide which one of them was the most beautiful, the most devoted, and the most pure. You know, the usual banter among friends and relatives, I guess. Colatinus bragged that no one surpassed his beloved wife, Lucrezia. Because they could not reach a conclusion and agreement, they decided to mount their horses, ride to Rome and Colantia, and check on their wives, so they could decide whose wife was the best. And so they did. They stopped by each of their residences and each found their wives entertaining friends. Then they reached Colantinus's house in the city of Colantia, and they saw his beautiful wife Lucrezia weaving alongside her maidens in the dead of night. They were all struck by her beauty and her dedication and apparently, as Livy puts it, her proven chastity. Colantinus was declared the winner, but a dark desire was born in Sextus Tarquinus's heart when gazing upon Lucrezia. They returned to the military camp and carried on with their duties as normal. A few days later, Sextus took a single servant with him and, unknown to anyone, went to Colantinus's house where he was welcomed and invited to dinner as he was Colantinus's cousin and the prince. He was offered a guest room and bid good night. He waited until he was sure all were asleep in the household, took his sword and snuck in Lucrezia's chambers. He immobilized her and put the sword to her throat and started declaring his love, intertwining threats with prayers and pleads. Seeing she would not budge and give in, he started threatening her. Again, she would not give in. So he started threatening to murder her, murder one of her slaves and place his body next to hers in bed so that everybody would believe that she was punished for adultery. This broke her will as it would forever stain her memory and honor and that of her husband and her father, and she gave in. He forced himself upon her and left her in disgrace, proudly walking back in the camp in the morning. She immediately sent trusted servants with messages, one to her father in Rome and one to her husband before Ardea, and asked them to come as fast as possible as something unspeakable has happened, and bring only a trusted person with them. Her father, Spurius Lucretius brought Publius Valerius, while Colantinus brought Lucius Junius Brutus, by chance. When reaching Colantinus's house, they found Lucrezia in her bed, in tears. She told them what happened, and had them swear that Sextus Tarquinus would not go unpunished. All four men swore and tried to comfort her, telling her that the mind sins, not the body, and that she bears no guilt, that she was the victim. She answered that she absolved herself of the sin, but not of the punishment. And with that, she revealed the knife she kept hidden, and before they could react, she plunged it in her heart. Her father and husband wailed in shock and pain as she lied there dead. Brutus, with pure hatred in his eyes, took the knife out of Lucrezia's heart to everybody's shock and with blood dripping, vowed this. By this blood most chaste until the prince wronged it, I swear, and I take you gods to witness, that I will pursue Lucius Tarwinus Superbus and his wicked wife and all his children with sword, with fire, I, with whatsoever violence I may, and that I will suffer neither them nor any other to be king in Rome. He then passed the knife to the other three men who were still in shock at this sight. And with choked voices and tears on their faces, all three took the same oath. And then they took Lucrezia's body into the marketplace where men gathered around them. And as they recounted what had transpired, 
more and more came forward to bring their own grievance against the prince and their father, Tarwinus Superbus. The people were moved by the man's grief, but fired up by Brutus, who urged them to take up arms against the king and his kin. Many of the gathered men armed themselves and offered to help Brutus. Brutus left Lucretius in charge of the city, with sentinels posted on the battlements, and accompanied by a host of men under his command, set out for Rome. Once reaching Rome, he ordered heralds round to every corner of the city and gathered the people. At first, the people were of course apprehensive, but seeing that it was a man with good standing in the city, although they knew him as a fool, now fired up, they came in droves. He held a speech before the tribune of the Celeres, where he held office. He spoke of the deeds of Sextus Tarwinus. He spoke of how the mighty men of Rome, those who conquered those around them and were descendants of gods, were sent to build sewers and unclog them. How they were used as artisans and stone cutters, although they were meant to wield the sword. How they were treated. He spoke of how Lucretia was defiled and how she ended it all. He reminded them of the wickedness of the king and how he brought the state down, how he murdered the old king Tullius and how his own wife, the king's daughter, drove her chariot over the king's body in view of many, how he killed, he butchered many of the fathers. Many volunteers came forth as he managed to rouse them. They remembered their power and their role, and they decided to retract the king's authority and to exile Tarwinus Superbus, his wife Tullia, and his children. The volunteers were then armed and set out to Ardea to instigate the army to revolt. The city was left in Colatinus's care, as he was once a prefect of Rome and guards were placed on the walls. Tullia fled from her home and everywhere she went she was cursed by those who saw her, calling down the furies upon her and her kin. Tarwinus caught wind of what was happening in his city and he decided to make for Rome to put down the revolt. Brutus, expecting this, took a different route as to not meet the king in the field. Tarwinus reached Rome at the same time Brutus reached Ardea. Rome's gates were closed and from the walls the king was exiled alongside his family. On the other hand, Brutus was cheered as the liberator of the city by the troops. The king's eldest sons followed him in exile in Care, in Etruria, while Sextus <laughs> returned to Gabi as if it were his property. There, the people seeing him return and remembering what he did to them and how he betrayed them and killed their leaders, slew him. And with that, the rule of the last and bloodiest king of Rome came to an end. Let us take one last look at the mini before wrapping this story up. A few final touches with Stormhost silver here and there. On the crossbands of the helmet, on the rim of the shield and on the shoulder. Just adding the last highlights. Now to finish the miniature I will paint in the face. I will keep it simple, a mix of catechan flesh and bugman's glow as a base, add a little bit more bugman to lighten the paint, offer the highlights and then use Agrax Earthshade to bring everything together and deepen the shadows of the face. And that's about it for the skin. I'm considering painting in the eyes and I will actually try it, but with the rim of the helmet right on the brow uh, and very deep shadows, I know if I insist on painting the eyes, I will end up ruining the face. So if it doesn't look right in the first go, I'll leave it at that. I plan on using very washed down paints to paint a short beard on his face. This individual is a veteran who has seen too much. That's why he ignored the fiery sword dropped by a hero on the battlefield. He's here to do a job and get back home in one piece. He keeps his helmet tightly on his head, has a full bushy beard to protect from the sun and dust and prying eyes, and you can barely see his eyes. He has seen it all and lived to tell the tale. He's a badass. Now, for the end of our story. Once Tarwinus was exiled, Rome elected its first two councils to share power with the Senate. Lucius Junius Brutus and Lucius Tarwinus Collatinus. To make sure that the people were not under two rulers at the same time, each council held the rod of power in turn, with Brutus being the first, but always needed Colatinus's consent when making decisions, as well as that of the Senate. He had the people swear that they would never again suffer a king, and then he replenished the number of fathers or senators after Tywinus butchered them. 
Tarwinus tried on several occasions to regain control of Rome. He went to the Etruscans in Etruria and persuaded two cities, Vei and Tarwini, uh, the city of his father's origin, to send help. They sent contingents to join Tarwinus' Latin forces. They marched on Rome and as they were approaching, Brutus ordered Colatinus to resign and go into exile as he bore the hated name Tarwinus. Colatinus was devastated by this betrayal but submitted to the judgment. Lucretius, his father-in-law, was elected to replace him. At the same time, Tarwinus was lobbying the Senate to allow him to retrieve some personal property, but actually he was trying to buy them off. The plot was discovered and those in league with the previous king were put to death. Brutus had to execute his own sons before the people as they were in league with Tarwinus. He then marched out and clashed with the king's forces in the Battle of Silva Arcia. The Romans were victorious but with severe losses. Brutus and his cousin Aruns Tarwinus met in battle and both fell by each other's sword. Tarwinus turned then to Lars Porsena, the king of Clusium, who agreed to march on Rome and reinstate him on the throne. The Romans put up an epic fight and defended their walls, pushing back Lars Porsena and his forces. Here we have other legends worthy of mention, such as Horatius on the bridge and the legendary Gaius Mucius Scevola, but these are stories for another time. Tarwinus' last attempt came in 498 BCE, when he persuaded his son-in-law Octavius Mamilus, the dictator of Tusculum, to march on Rome. Rome also elected the dictator Albus Postumius Albus and his master of the horse, Titus Ebutius. Again, another story for another time, as it is really important to, and interesting, to explain and to understand what the role of the dictators initially were, and that of the masters of the horse. Tarwinus and his last son, Titus Tarwinus, leading an army of Roman exiles, marched on Rome alongside Latin. Mamilius was killed in battle, Ebutius severely injured, and Titus Tarwinus barely escaped with his life. The Romans were again victorious, but at a very great cost. Tarwinus found refuge in Cumae at Arisodemus's court, and died in 495 BC. Not the most satisfying of endings to such a savage and bloody tyrant, but it is what it is. Lucius Darwinus Superbus ruled for 25 years through sheer terror. He broke old oaths, old traditions and treated Rome as his own property, despoiling it. He was the exact opposite of what the Romans aspired to be and were for a while under the old kings. His deeds and his debaucheries and his defilement stirred something deep in the hearts of the Roman people that for the next almost 500 years they fought tooth and nail not to have another king. Even Caesar was inches away from breaking this oath that the Roman people took and accept becoming a king, but not even he did such a thing. Lucretia's defilement was the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back, and for good reason, for it was a heinous act that somehow was the culmination of the defilement of Rome itself. Between the foundation of Rome, the start of Romulus' reign, and the exile of Tarwinus Superbus, Rome was under kings for 244 years. And to be honest, I find it quite fitting somehow that the last king of Rome was removed by a man named Brutus, while Julius Caesar, himself a man who broke all traditions and conventions, despoiling and defiling Rome, was delivered the final blow by a man named Brutus. Anyway, it's quite fitting. <laughs> I truly hope you learned something new today and found some inspiration. I know it was a very long story and I hope you found it was worth it and thank you for sticking around. I would love to hear your thoughts around this whole story, so don't be shy and leave a comment below. Now, like, subscribe and share this video with your friends, your neighbors, your DMs, your GMs, your storytellers, your cousins, your parents, grandparents, pets, everybody. But only if you liked it. And with that, I want to thank you for the privilege of your time and I can't wait to see you all funky people here next time on Funky Monkey MP 
a place where you get your dose of mini painting, history, world building and trivia. Remember, be curious, take inspiration from the past and never stop world building and creating awesome things, whatever those are. Your mind and imagination are amazing and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Until next time, have yourselves a wonderful, wonderful day. Cheers. This would explain Tarwinus's tardis, tardides uh, prove the Gabi tactics against Rome's. And when dividing the spoils, they get their share fair, 